right. How many of you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Man, so thankful. It's great to see all of you. Looks like we're getting another just wave of great weather coming through, and so I'm always thankful for that. Before um, I hop into the message today, I want to briefly mention the offering. Thank you so much for your faithfulness uh, to this house and the way that you help us so much. I was reflecting on this over the weekends, and I was thinking about, <clears throat> if you don't know our, our history, we, we started in a, in a metal building just down the street from here that's now Life Fellowship Church. And uh, we got about 60 people in that building um, on, on a, a weekend. And I remember the, the first time we had 50, uh, we, we cried about it. Uh, we thought, man, that's crazy. You know, we had 50 folks today. And we used to use a phrase there a lot, and we would say, we need you. And we would talk about just serving and giving and all of those things. And that's still very, very true. Um, you know, you, you've heard of the, uh, the phrase that says, um, you know, small church, small resource, big church, big, big resource. And that's so true because the more people you have, the more ministry you're, you're, you're doing. And so I just want to pause, say thank you for that, and um, pray blessing over you and uh, ask you to consider joining us on, on this, this journey of being able to resource the people around us and ministries that, that we do and so on. We are a big church planting church, and um, we are grateful to have had the opportunity from right, right here to give to hundreds and hundreds of churches around the world. And so uh, thank you so much for your faithfulness in that. I want you to go today to Philippians chapter 3. If you're just joining us, we are in a series on the book of Philippians. And uh, this is a great chapter. And so um, we're, we're going to go there today and just kind of go verse by, by verse uh, through about five or six of these. And um, if, if you have been reading this along with us, you... You know that this, I think I said it last week, this is a very fun book to read, very hard book to apply. So it's very, very meaty, and it's got a lot of application to it, and so I hope that you've seen that in your own reading. So go to Philippians chapter 3, I'll be there in just a moment, but I want to in intro this by saying that sometimes um, I can forget where we are as a nation and uh, I'm easily swallowed up by my own time frame, as you are as well, and what, what that looks like for you. We, we tend to kind of forget history, and we, we just focus on where we are right now. And um, however, as I reflected this week on the beginning of our country, there is a line from the Declaration of Independence that I love, and it says this, We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain ina inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and what? The pursuit of happiness, yeah. And so as, as I read that again this week, I begin to think that our, our founding fathers, for whatever reason, had sensed or felt that there was something really big about being able to pursue happiness, whether it was emotionally or relationally or financially or even spiritually, our ability to pursue happiness was a big deal to the founding of this country to say we want to be able to be a platform for people to pursue what brings them happiness. And they had sensed that somewhere along their, their own journeys. So in our own times, I think the pursuit of happiness has been inspired through uh, the art of asking questions. Questions like, what do I want to do with my life? Or where is my passion? Or where is my peace? These are questions that help us fully explore or pursue happiness. What do I want my life to look like? Because that obviously brings me joy. Where is my peace at? That's going to bring us happiness as well. So in full disclosure, I think we're doing really well at pursuing happiness. I think we, we do it nonstop. We're always looking for what could make us happy or happier. But I don't think we're doing well at finding it. 
And research, however, is going to tell us that we are doing a great job at finding stress. Okay, I read this week that current stress levels in many homes are similar to those found in active war zones. All right. So um, the research there was basically saying that uh, if you were to somehow measure the stress level of an individual in an active war zone, there are some people's home environment where they are experiencing the same level of stress. Not to say it's the same thing, but their bodies are responding in the same way. So it's kind of sad, and you might be from that home. You might be from a, a, a place where you go, man, this is, this is very chaotic and very tense and it's not a healthy home dynamic. And stress can come in different forms. And I was reading this week again in 1961, Roger Maris was chasing Babe Ruth's home run record and he went to his doctor because he thought he was terribly ill. And he said, listen, I, I'm, I'm not sleeping. I'm, I'm going, you know, a full day or a day and a half until I, I crash and my hair is falling out and I'm not eating. I'm losing, I'm losing weight. I've already changed my, my uniform and, and all of those things. And after some tests being ran, the doctor came back and he said, quote, you're suffocating under the stress that you've created in yourself to hit a ball over a fence. Like you've created that amount of stress in your body to the point that you're losing sleep and appetite and your, and your hair is falling out, etc. A few weeks ago when Muss left uh, for USC, I was like, who, who are we going to get? Who's going to use the portal better than Muss? This is a huge mistake. And I recognized that my, my heart was increasing. I had a feeling like something bad was happening. And I realized I'm not sick. This is just what it's like being a Razorback fan. You know, you, you, you can create stress over anything. The top three causes of stress in our country are, in this order, money, marriage, and health. The top three reported categories. I'm always tense about money, where, where to get it, how to get more of it. I, I don't have enough of it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to make the, the, the ends meet. And so we have a lot of stress over money. We have a lot of stress over marital relationships. Just a, a, again, what I said at the very beginning a few moments ago about tension in, in the home. And how to get that re resolved. And then our, our own health. Where am I with my mental health, my, my, my physical health, and so on. Each of us have chosen different ways to cope with those stress categories. Some people find comfort in food. They have comforting foods that they enjoy. I will not lie, I'm one of those. But I have heavy research to back it up. I don't know if you are aware of this, but this, hang on. This, this is very, very, very true. The more you weigh, the more difficult it is to be kidnapped. Okay? So here's my advice. Stay safe and eat more cake. Okay? That's my, that's my advice. Some people use alcohol. What begins as wine with dinner turns into much more than that. And before you know it, you have numbed your anxieties, at least for the evening. Some people binge media. I didn't think this was a real thing until COVID. And it would be a beautiful Saturday, a day where people could get out on, on their porch. Maybe you couldn't go anywhere. But in, in uh, looking back, instead of getting outside, people would watch two entire seasons of The Walking Dead on a Saturday. And it's like they was just them, Daryl, and uh, Totino's Pizza Rolls. And they would just sit there and just, just binge watch. And just numb their stress with that. Well, in, in chapter 3 of this book, there are going to be some stress killers that we're going to wrap our minds around this morning. I'm going to talk out three of those because that's what preachers do. They can't ever have four points. And so this should become habits 
For all of us, and I hope that you can spend some time this week just reflecting on these stress killers and what they would mean for your life in ways that you can relax with, with, with God. The first habit I'm going to talk about today is this, recognizing the grace of God in your life. I, I, I may should say it this way to re-recognize the grace of God. I think when, when we come to God, we, we get this really fast, like we don't deserve this. I think it's why some people hit pause on even having a relationship with God. They don't think they deserve it, so they don't pursue it. But when we come to Christ, we recognize, I've done some things, some things I, I shouldn't do. I've had some thoughts, some behaviors. I've got a past, and I'm not proud of it. And we understand the magnitude of being covered by the blood of Christ for all of those things, and we experience the grace of God. And as time goes on, we kind of forget that big initial wave of, of, of grace. So we either need to recognize that this morning or re-recognize it. Philippians 3 and verse 3, and this is where we'll start. If you'll just keep your finger there, I'm going to go right down through, through, through this. But verse 3 says, We Christians glory or revel in what Jesus has done for us. Everybody say, for us. And we realize that we are helpless to save ourselves. Okay? Now, I've been in church a long time. Most of you have been in church for a long time. And this is still one struggle that our humanity will not release us on, is just receiving something from Christ that we do not deserve. We want to earn it. We want to work for it. We want to do something that says, I've done this and now you've done that. And we have to really get this, that our relationship with the Father is not transactional. This is not a, I'm going to do something and now you're going to do something and because we've both done something, we're now friends or, or now you're my savior. No, this is a gift that you're never going to be able to earn and you're never going to be able to do enough to, to, to get it in your life. You just have to receive it. So we have to recognize there's a grace on our lives. And if you're here this morning and you're just stressed to the max about, about a season you're in or a behavior you've got or a thought pattern you have, if you will turn those over to God, you can recognize the grace of God in your life and realize that He's going to help you through a journey of transformation. Now, if you are resisting that, if you've got something, if you've got a vice, if you've got a sin, and you will not let go of it, then that's on you. But if you will release that to God and receive His grace in your life, it will help you with your stress about where you are in this journey. Here's one fascinating thing about joy and grace. Okay, the Greek word for joy is kara, and the Greek word for grace is charis. It's where we get the word charismatic. Okay, to have a person that is that is full of joy is where that that word charismatic came from. They're expressing great joy. That is charismatic, but they share the same root word. So I don't think this is a mistake. I think the words themselves are preaching a great sermon to us, meaning this, to receive unspeakable joy, you must first experience unexplainable grace. Let me say that one, one, one more time. To receive a joy that is unspeakable, you must first receive a grace that is unexplainable. And this comes from the same word. And so I, I think as brilliant as Paul is, he's teaching us this principle to say that you've got a reason to be happy. You've got a reason to have joy because you did not deserve this great gift that God gave us. So I can't explain this grace. I can't explain the depth of the cross I can't explain how big and grand and deep and wide it, it, it all is. 
We could come to this, to this place every Sunday for a hundred years and never fully be able to explain the incredibleness of what happened with the cross. Because of that, we get to receive an unspeakable joy that Scripture talks about. Like I'm happy and I don't even know why. It's what enables us to say goodbye to loved ones with an incredible hope that we'll see them again. And that brings us joy. Paul even goes on to say, we don't mourn like, like other people. Why? Because there's an unexplainable grace that gives us an unspeakable joy. I can't put in words the joy that comes from having experienced grace. Philippians 3 and 9, he says this, and Paul's about to, about to, to dig in here. He says, I no longer count on my own goodness, meaning that he once did. And he says, and I no longer count on my own ability, which means he once did. Instead, I trust Christ to save me. That's great words. I once counted on the fact of how good I was, and I once counted on the fact of my own ability to give me a connection to God. And he's saying, and I don't do it any, anymore because I realize that it's too big. It's too much for me to grab a hold of. I, I would need a thousand lifetimes to even start the process of earning this such incredible gift. So your salvation, hear me this morning, is not in your performance. It is in your pardon. And you must just receive it. And so if that's you this morning, I want to challenge you with this. Stop trying. Stop trying to work it. Stop trying to do things. Stop, stop trying to go to God with a resume of sorts and, and convince Him to take you. Just receive this unexplainable grace that you may partake in unspeakable joy. The second habit is this. Remember what is most important. This is one I'm having to work on myself. I'm having on the daily to remember what is most important. And I don't know how your brain works, but I know how mine works. And this is important to me because the insignificant things in my life can dominate my thought life. If I allow it, insignificant things can take up hours of thought life every day for me. I can chase a rabbit of, of something I'm disappointed in or discouraged in or a person that I'm irritated with or a task I've got to do or an expectation I feel I must live up to. And then before this day is over, I've realized that any break I've had from doing, any time that was, that was just for me to just sit and be and exist came with, with tension. And so what happens there? Stress sets in. Because we are, we do have a great tendency to be discouraged and disappointed and upset and wanting things to change and wanting people to change their minds and, and so on. And so we've got to remember what is important. And if you haven't done this little exercise and asked yourself, what is important to me? And let those things rise up out of your mind as columns that are forming every day that are identified. I know these things are important in my life. Verse 7 says, all the things. I love how, how he says all of them. Like too much to list. All the things that I once thought were so important to me. I now consider, watch this worth nothing because of Christ. He's saying this. There's been a shift in, in the way I think about life. There's been a shift in the way I view people. There's been a shift in how I view myself and my part in this world. All the things that I once thought were so important, I count as nothing. We've got to remember what is most important. Paul, at one point, had a laundry list of things he was striving for. If you study his life, he was very educated. At one point, he was in the elite crowd. 
He was an up-and-comer. His name was mentioned in meetings. He was a citizen of, of Rome, possibly the most cultured empire since Egypt. And he's preaching to us that none of those things mattered once he found Christ. Like once I realized the weight of what happened to me, my life shifted. Now, Paul had a brand new definition of this, and he goes on to tell us this. But he says this, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And I think that is an incredible Mantra. If I'm alive, I want to be exuding Christ. And when I die, it's a full gain for me. It's the same guy that, that goes on to say, to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. Verse 8, he goes on and he says, Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the priceless gain of knowing Christ Jesus, my, my Lord. Another version says, I have discarded everything, counting it as garbage, so that I may have Christ and become one with Him. Now this word garbage is actually a polite translation. If you grew up using the King James Version, you know what he says here. He says, I count it all as dung. Okay? I'm not going to go on about that word, but I'll say this, none of us want to be around it. You will step over it. You will step around it. And I love the strength of what Paul is saying. I think purposely he's using this word to say it is so off-putting the things that I used to prioritize in my life. I have counted it as garbage, as dung. I don't even want it on my shoes. Because he's trying to tell us that we've got to reprioritize in our life. As Christ is doing amazing things in us, there are things that rise to the surface to say, this is now the most important thing in your life. And let me talk really strong for just, just a moment. There are some in this room today who need to give up something in your life so that you may see with greater clarity the more important thing in your life. you got to give it up so that you can make a room for what God is doing. I think we talked about this last week. You've got to take the garbage out, right? This is what Paul is, is echoing to us from chapter 2 of last week. Habit 3. This is, this is, this is the, the toughest one of all of them. Forget what you cannot change. All right? I want to pull the room because I want to put us on some level ground, but how many of you struggle with this area? Just raise, raise, raise it up, yeah. We all do. We all struggle too. Here's why, because God gave you a memory, all right? So this, this word forgetting is not like what, what we use in, in the word forgetting when it talks about that God you know, removes your sin away and doesn't think about it anymore. This word forgetting is more of a letting go. It doesn't mean like you're, you're praying, I, I don't want to remember those things anymore. No, that's not what that means. And here's why. Your memory is an extremely powerful tool. Okay? It lets you remember all the good and you remember all the bad. And what we have to do somehow as spiritually mature people is to comprehend that anything that has happened in your life that you would label as bad, God will use that and turn it for the good. He will use it in your life. Now, you may never like be just proud of it, but you will draw strength from it. You will gain wisdom from it. So you will look at something that happened and an outcome and a terrible storm that you created at your own hand, but then you will realize this is now strength in my adult life. 
And it's not a moment that I've ever been proud of. However, I'm going to now pull from that and use it to teach my children to avoid it. And so he says this, that forgetting is basically a habit of happiness. That me letting go of all of those things does nothing but exponentially increase my ability to receive and make room for more joy. The more things I let go of, the more real estate I have internally for more joy. Every day, make it a habit to not spend time on what you cannot change. In other words, don't give space to thoughtless waste. Do not give space to thoughtless waste. Worry or regret or shame does not change our past. Now again, if you're sitting in it, if you're not doing anything about it, if you're not repenting, completely different sermon. But I'm talking about someone who has come to Christ, who has repented, who has turned, and they are regretful about their past, about their old person. Do not focus on that. As a pastor, as someone who cares for you, I know that many of you have big hurts. I've heard your stories. Many of you are hurt deeply and in ways that you will never forget emotionally and physically. You've been hurt in many, many ways, and I can tell you that God is not pleased with what has happened to you. But hear me today. Hear me. To have deep joy, you have to face those things. I know I've I've made a joke about it, but you can't eat enough food to cover up childhood trauma. You can't drink enough to cover up years of physical abuse. You have to face it and accept that it was part of your story. It happened to you. And you were a terrible victim. And it happened. But then you have to understand that all of your story, even the terrible parts, have been completely redeemed through Jesus Christ. So he takes the good and the bad and the ugly and he loves all of it together. And he rede- he's, he's not asking you to forget what happened, but he does want you to come to a new understanding of redemption that will allow you to open your hand of it. Where you don't have to hate people anymore. And you don't have to be bitter. And you don't have to have your identity wrapped up in something that happened to you. But now your identity is in Christ, the one who redeemed you. And so Paul is saying, I'm going to forget those things. Meaning, I am going to let go of those things. I think the great wisdom we have from Paul is because of the terrible things that happened in his life. Paul had to let go of two things. Things that he had done and things that he had done to him. Verse 14. I am focusing all my energy on one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. He says, I strain to reach the end of, of the race. You know that, 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 that image where runners, and, and they're very close to each other, and they put their arms behind them, and they put their chest out in front of them? That's the image I have of Paul here. I'm straining to reach the end and receive the prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us up to heaven. We often forget because we've made him such a hero, but Paul was there when a young man named Stephen was stoned to death. He was actively involved. He says, let let me hold, hold your coats while you guys throw rocks and kill this dude. He was there, persecuted many, 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 many Christians. He had that in his past. 
He has to let, let go of it. Can you imagine what would have happened if on the road to Damascus, Saul falls off his horse under the powerful move that was happening right there on the street and he says, I, I can't do this because of what, I, what my life has been like. What if he had stopped? What, what if he had given up? What if he hadn't put into practice this incredible thing of letting go? He also was on the flip side of that. He was beaten and stoned and abused. He had taken 39 lashes many, many, many times. If whatever image you have of Paul in your mind physically is wrong, this dude was beat so much. The, the scar tissue across his body would, would, would give him a physical deformation. Just beaten, stoned, abused. He had to get past it. We've got to forget what, what we cannot change. Sometimes when I'm out of town and I'll go to get gas and I'll, I'll put my card in and it'll, it'll say, what's your zip code? It doesn't ask me that when I'm here. It doesn't ask me that when I'm in Little Rock. But if I'm traveling, it'll say, it recognizes, hey, you're not from around here. This card could be stolen. So to verify, it's you. At least tell us where the zip code is. That pump suspects you're not from around here. What I'm about, about to read to you right here is probably, in my, my opinion, as I'm studying through this series, this is one of the best verses Paul pins in Philippians 3. He says, verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven. I believe this is why he is so encouraged. He says, we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, there's a stress reducer right there, will transform our bodies to be like, like his. Let me tell you why sometimes you feel disconnected here. Some of you are going to agree with, disagree with this, and that, that, that's okay. I don't think it's because you're depressed when you feel disconnected from here. I think sometimes when you feel like, like you don't fit here, I don't think that's depression. I think it's because you have citizenship elsewhere. God designed us to enjoy like, like this experience while also balancing it with citizenship elsewhere. I can have a longing to be elsewhere while still enjoying the beauty of this place, my relationships, my family, our church. And I'm at this point in my life, I just turned 51 last month, and I'm to this point where now I have grandparents in heaven. All my grandparents are there. I have a daughter there. I have a mom there, my sister. I have many friends. Heaven has become this place that is not in a, in a book any longer. But it's, it's a place of, 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 of hope and destination. It's a place of going, man, what if, what if one day I'm there and I experience that? It's a citizenship in heaven. And like Paul, as I read this this week, I just sat still at my desk a minute and I just reflected on this. And I just kept thinking about how I, I, I want to finish the race well, and I know that you do as well. And it's going to take us casting away everything that's not important in this life and not get hung up on the insignificant things and not get hung up on the things that, that we cannot fix and that we cannot change. And turning all that full control over to God and realizing we are a citizen of heaven. And if you don't feel like you belong here, it's okay. Because sometimes I don't either. And if sometimes you're sad and you long for a better place and a different place, it's okay. Because that's not coming from, from your feelings. That's coming from your faith. 
a place that's sweeter and greater and better, a place where they always serve cake. I'm thankful this morning that here we have Paul writing to us from prison. And he's saying, I want you to remember what's important. And I want you to forget about the things you cannot change. And here in a moment, we're just going to bow our heads in prayer. And as we do, I want you to think about that. Because there's some of you that are stuck. and Maybe you've been stuck for years. on something you can't change and somebody you can't change and a situation you can't change and a grief cycle you can't change. You need to let that transforming shift come into your mind where you go, it's it's okay for me to open my hand. It's all right for me to let that person go. It's all right for me to not be hurt. I don't have to have identity in this anymore. Because my identity is is in Christ. So I'm going to open my hand. I'm going to let some people off the hook. I'm going to let myself off the hook. I'm going to forget the things I can't change. Why don't you bow your heads with me really quick this morning. Maybe you're in the room and that's you. Here in a minute, we're just going to open up the front of this church. If you would like to come up for prayer for that, maybe you need to give your heart to God this morning. Maybe you've been running. Maybe you've got sin in your heart. And you just need a space to talk to God. The front of this church is open. And you can come and kneel and stand here. We're going to put people around you really quick. I'll just pray with you. But I would challenge you, if you're in the room today and you feel stuck, to be prayed with. Why don't you stand with me all across the room, everybody in the house today. Lord, we love you. We're thankful for the... We're thankful for the room today. God, I'm thankful that today that you've reminded us of how much you love us and that you can redeem any part of our story.